So I'm wanting to remind us from the beginning that we're not just talking about here about our worries about our own potential extinction. We're in a situation where we have already made many other species extinct. And I'm going to be talking this afternoon mainly about the climate crisis. So before I get into the main meat of the talk, I want to just take a moment on the biodiversity crisis and the broader extinction crisis, which is very much part of what we need to be concerned about, both for our own sake, because of the way we depend on the rest of nature, and for the sake of rest of the rest of nature itself. So just a, a couple of um, truly terrible facts. As many of you probably know, the World Wildlife Fund study tells us that we've exterminated, humanity has exterminated over half of wildlife in the last 40 to 50 years. So that's during my lifetime and the lifetime of many of us in the room. Over half of wildlife gone. And we are the sixth mass extinction. We are causing the first extinction in the history of our planet mass extinction, which is occurring as a result of just one species taking over so much of the Earth. We are rendering extinct about one species every 10 minutes. So by the time I finish my talk, there'll be about five more species gone. You really have to give these things some time to land. They're so, they're so terrible, so new, so awesomely prompting of us to change what we're doing and do something different. So before I get into the main meat of my talk, which as I say is going to be mainly about climate, I'd like us to just take a moment together to contemplate the broader extinction crisis and to think in particular about the animals and plants and other species, other beings that we have already rendered extinct uh, and that are going extinct right now uh, while we're sitting here. So I'd like to ask you please to join with me in a solemn minute silence to contemplate that. Okay, thank you very much for that. Your money or your life. You all know this catchphrase of the old highwaymen in this country. The basic idea was the highwayman, highwayman would point a pistol at you and say, your money or your life, and if you were sensible, you'd hand over your money, and that way you could buy your life. Um, and I think most people who did that probably thought afterwards, you know, yeah, well, that was a pretty good trade, actually. I'm pretty happy that I decided to do that. The situation that we're in, unfortunately, isn't quite as easy as that. Uh, there isn't way, any way in which we can buy our own uh, individual salvation in the situation that we're now facing. Not even if we're very rich. I'll explain that better towards the end of my talk. The situation is one where we're in, we really are all in this together. This is a collective emergency. And it's also a long emergency. In fact, it's likely to be a permanent emergency. One of the really important things to bear in mind about the climate crisis is that we are permanently in catch-up mode because of the enormous time lags built into the climate system. So if we were to stop all carbon emissions tomorrow, then the climate situation would carry on getting worse for at least about the next 20 to 30 years. Obviously, that's not going to happen, but even if it did happen, the situation would carry on worsening for at least a generation, probably a lot more than that. This is because carbon dioxide stays in the atmosphere for decades, for centuries, uh, and it's because of the heating that we've pumped, the excess heating that we've pumped through the warming that's already taken place into the oceans. The oceans have absorbed most of the heating so far, so they're going to be distributing that heating for a long time to come and melting a lot of ice 
as a result of it. So this is a long, almost certainly a permanent emergency, an entire new situation to get used to. It's going to be the texture of all of our lives, almost certainly, for the rest of our days. So if only it were as simple as us being able to buy our way out. It's going to be actually a lot, lot harder than that, and I'll explain why. Some of you are probably thinking, well, yeah, but isn't there at least some hope that politicians, that leaders, are going to be big enough to step up to the plate on this? What about the Paris Agreement? Isn't the Paris Agreement something that gives us some hope that this terrible situation is going to be headed off at the pass before some of us uh, are dead? And let's make no mistake, the Paris Agreement was an extraordinary diplomatic achievement. Every country in the world had to sign up in order for it to work. And they did. It's hard to believe that we're going to get a successful international climate agreement which is going to be more ambitious than the Paris Agreement. And of course, since then, things have got worse. Things have got worse in the sense that the United States has pulled out of Paris. They've got worse in the sense that we've come to know more about the perilousness of our situation scientifically, about how much heat, for example, there is stored in the ocean, a lot more than we thought a few years ago. And most crucially of all, it's got worse because in the last few years, it seems that our weather, in other words, our climate, because weather is just climate on a very short view, is spinning out of control. We had the first ever 20 degree temperatures in February, in, in uh, the first ever 20 degree temperatures in winter uh, in this country uh, last week. Um, and, you know, it might be nice to be able to lick an ice cream on the beach in February, but well, what's it going to be like in July uh, in that case, this year or next year or some year soon? And that's just, you know, m very mild compared to, as, as I'm sure you know, what's been happening in other parts of the world, wildlife, wildfires out of control, for example, in, uh, in recent times in parts of America, uh, in parts of the Arctic. Um, and I never thought I'd hear that phrase, wildfires out of control in the Arctic. Temperatures of tw over 20 degrees uh, above uh, the, uh, the average for that time of year in the Arctic. Paris is not going to save us. I'm just going to run through this very, very briefly. It's very, very important. And once you get your head around it, it really does change everything. So the Paris targets are insufficiently bold. Uh, most scientists think that if they were achieved, um, they would not save us from dangerous climate change. The achievement of those targets depends upon voluntary, there's no enforcement to Paris, voluntary agreements uh, among every country in the world, and in particular, voluntary contributions to carbon reduction on the part of every country in the world. If you put together all the voluntary contributions that have been pledged, they come way short of the Paris target. So the target's already inadequate. The contributions pledged are way short of that. No country, or at least no major developed country, has credible plans even to achieve its own inadequate uh, targets. Um, and in fact, the situation is a lot worse than that, in that pretty much every country in the world has plans to not achieve its target. If you understand what I mean, I'll explain. Pretty much every country in the world has plans for economic growth, for infrastructure um, uh, expansion, for airport expansion. Those plans all point in the opposite direction from the inadequate voluntary contributions which those countries have pledged. So picture the following scene. You've got a, a cabinet meeting, the climate change secretary, and pretty much any country in the world is saying, well, we pledged this towards Paris, so you know, we really need to do more to achieve our climate change um, reduction targets, our emissions reduction targets. And then you've got the business minister or the chancellor saying, yes, that's all very nice, but we need to do this in order to have economic growth and to have infrastructure growth and to have jobs and so on and so forth. Which of those two ministers is likely to win uh, that argument. I'll leave you to take a guess. So pretty much every country in the world has plans to not achieve its Paris targets, the targets which are already um, inadequate. And pretty much no major country in the world is anywhere near on course to meet its uh, Paris targets. However, things are actually considerably worse than that. You need to understand that the science behind Paris is arguably already inadequate in the sense that it's highly conservative the UN process, the UN scientific process, highly conservative. It basically leaves out of account anything which, which pretty much not all scientists in the world uh, can uh, agree upon. It's a consensus-driven process. It's also influenced 
by uh, politics at the final um, stages of the production of the documents. And so left out of Paris is the feedbacks which are likely to occur. The factors that I've already given you mean that we're not going to achieve 1.5 degrees. We're not going to achieve 2 degrees. We're going, to, we're going to go to something like 3 degrees, 3.5 degrees of overheating. When you get to that level, the feedbacks which we're already starting to see become a lot worse. What are the feedbacks? So you're probably aware of the loss of ice um, in the Arctic and in other parts of the world. When you lose ice, it means that less heat and light gets reflected back off. You absorb more into the dark oceans, and that becomes a vicious feedback, meaning that you absorb more heat, you reflect less. Um, when you've done that, then it melts more ice, and then you absorb even more heat, and so on and so forth. But that's not even the worst of the feedbacks. The probably worst of the feedbacks is the methane feedback. When you start getting a lot of melt in the permafrost and the Arctic regions, those are, they are heavily inundated with methane under the ground and under the sea. Methane is a warming gas which is somewhere between 25 and 100 times as powerful as, carb, uh, as CO2. Right? And we're starting to see that, uh, that, that methane spike. So when you get to 3 or 3.5 degrees of overheating, then you're almost certainly on a conveyor belt, as Mark Linus has explained in his book, uh, 6 degrees, to 4 or 5 degrees of overheating. And you're going to be losing various uh, other carbon sinks in the process. You're going to be losing the Amazon rainforest, for example, which is, that's going to turn to savanna or possibly to desert. Absolutely catastrophic from an ecological perspective, but also from a climate perspective. Bear in mind also that since the Paris Agreement, Bolsonaro has been elected as uh, president in Brazil. Bolsonaro is someone who is, it's hard to say this, but he's even worse than Trump. I mean, it's, it's hard to imagine, but it, it is actually true. There's one more thing about Paris. Paris depends for its success upon the use of geoengineering technologies, technologies to suck carbon out of the atmosphere in large quantities. These technologies do not at the present time exist. They would almost certainly be reckless to use, especially if they were used at large scale. They could do things like massively disrupt monsoons, depriving millions or possibly billions of, r of rain and food on which they depend. I've rattled through all that. The upshot of it is this that there is no rational basis for believing anything other than, we are, than that we are heading for four to five degrees of global overheat during this century. That is incompatible with civilization as we know it in numerous ways, but the most obvious way is it is incompatible with us having enough food to feed ourselves. It's just not possible with that amount of heat reducing crop yields, with that amount of uh, of disruption of, of rain cycles, massively reducing uh, uh, crop yields, not to mention the massively increased incidence of natural disasters that we're going to see. Of course, they're not really natural disasters anymore. Natural disasters you know, doesn't mean anything anymore. Almost all the things we now call natural disasters are partly anthropogenic. This civilization is going down. Civilization as we know it is not going to continue. Industrial growth society is not going to last through this century. Hope you can see that image. It kind of sums things up. It's some, some golfers golfing while there's an out of control forest fire behind them. It's from the United States, recent, States recently. Um, you know, this is already happening now with just one degree of, of overheat. So what's going to happen? It seems to me that there are three possibilities for the form that the end of this society will take. The first of these is that it will collapse utterly. There's various ways in which that could happen. The most obvious is the one I just mentioned, the collapse of our food system relative to the number of people that we have. One reason I put this image up is I think it's fascinating and important to contemplate how incredibly thin the atmosphere is, how incredibly thin the, the zone of life is compared to everything else, compared to the vastness of space, plus, of course, the interior of the Earth, where it's impossible. We have disrupted this in such a way that it's moving beyond our control. And it is entirely possible that human life as we know it will collapse during this century. There is a possibility that is not as bad as that. 
which is that as this society collapses, with vast, vast suffering, I mean, we're talking multiple, multiple uh, holocausts, that as that happens, or soon after that happens, we will manage to not have messed things up so completely that it's impossible for organized human life of some kind to continue and to be reborn. And I think this is really important, because I think that too often we think something like that the possibilities, the alternatives are either something like life as we know it is going to continue, society as we know it is going to continue, or everything will be gone. But there's actually a huge range in between those two. And one of the things we have to start to think about, given what I've already sketched, given how highly probable it is now, if you were a betting person, that you would bet on there being some kind of massive collapse event of human civilization this century, we have to start to think about how we can try to create the conditions for a society to succeed ours. Because I take it that it's clear that this possibility could be, depends how it plays out, but could be at least a hell of a lot better than the previous one. That it would be a terrible thing if through a failure of foresight, we failed to make it possible for the generations that will come after us to arise from out of the ashes that we have created. So one of the things I want you to do this afternoon is start to try to get us to think a bit more about this than I think we usually do. The third possibility is this, that this society will somehow manage to transform itself radically and rapidly in an unprecedented manner in time to avoid collapse. How could we possibly do that? It seems to me clear that the only way we could possibly do that is if we're willing to contemplate what I started out this talk by suggesting, if we're willing to actually look at the reality of where our leaders are committing us to, of what the Paris Climate Change Agreement in the real world will mean, and rebel against that. So we, what we need to do is we need to face the terrible reality of what is on the cards for this century. And if we really, really face up to that, and this is one of the central themes of my talk, if we really, really face up to that, then we may be able to put ourselves in a position where we can step up and do something so huge and so different and so unanticipated that we are not, after all, going to be condemned to go up this treadmill of two degrees, three degrees, four degrees, five degrees, degrees of global overheat, which, if we do allow that to go ahead, as I've explained, will lead to the ends of human civilization as we know it. Industrial growth society, the kind of society that we know is doomed, it is finished, because this possibility of transformation is going to mean such a huge shift that almost everything that we take for granted will no longer be there. If we manage to do it in this way, which avoids multiple, multiple holocausts, that's going to mean a complete change. It's going to mean far more, for example, than the Green New Deal or the New Green Deal, which people are talking about a lot at the moment. It's not just going to be like um, electric cars and flying a bit less or something, right? It's going to mean a massive, massive change in our way of life. So what is to be done? What is to be done in order to make it possible for us to have a shot at that transformation and in order to prepare ourselves for the possibility of collapse so that it doesn't just completely hit us and take us down. We have to ride both those horses simultaneously now because it would be tragically irrational. It would be overweening at this point to say, OK, well, we want to achieve transformation, so we'll stake everything on that. It's fantastically unlikely we're going to be able to succeed in the kind of drastic transformation that I've started to sketch. We must aim for it because it's the best outcome by far, but we must also realistically prepare to try to achieve the second, if you will, of my two options, rather than be condemned to the first one, of total collapse. So we have to try to transform, and we have to try to prepare ourselves to radically adapt to a collapsed future. We have to do both of those things at the same time. How are we going to do that? So I've got some ideas that I want to share with you this afternoon. All right, so here's the first idea. We need to wake up, and that really means we need to freak out. We need to do this over and over again, try to face this awesome, terrible 
reality, which seems so hard to grasp, perhaps, when you're sitting in a pleasant room like this in relatively temperate conditions with food waiting for us afterwards in the kitchen and so on and so forth. And when this crisis isn't blaring out as it should do from our newspapers and radio sets and TVs 24-7, you know, putting Brexit in the shade, you know, this is about 10,000 times more important than Brexit. I saw a tweet the other day, some politician tweeting, in 20 years' time, you know, people are going to be, historians are going to be talking about how terrible a choice Brexit was. And my, I replied, in 20 years' time, no one's going to give a flying whatever about Brexit because this will be preoccupying everybody as it should do already. The, reason, the main reason why it isn't preoccupying everybody already, arguably, is the time lags. Right? If we were able to be clear to ourselves that we've already committed ourselves to a much worse climate 20 or 30 years down the line, if we could get that clear in our minds, if we could see it in front of us in the same kind of way as you can see uh, a famine in pictures projected from the other side of the world, you know, then the airways wouldn't be dominated by Brexit, Brexit, Brexit. Sorry, I got a bit irate there, but uh, it's, um, it is infuriating the way that this, this complete sideshow is distracting us from being woken up to this far, far more fundamental issue or set of issues. Wake up, freak out, do it yourself, do it over and over again, Encourage others to start doing it. We need to transform this society, this society as I said. One of the ways we do need to do that is through what my think tank Greenhouse call transformative adaptation. What is transformative adaptation? So as I've explained, it is too late for a purely prevention-focused or mitigation-focused strategy in relation to climate. Right? It is no longer credible to say, it's, it's okay, we're going to tackle the sources of, of carbon emissions, we're going to get those down, we're going to make heroic changes like people did in the Second World War, we're going to have a new Green Deal, everything's going to be fine. No, things are already not fine and things are definitely going to get worse, whatever we do for the next 20 or 30 years. And as it is almost certain that we won't do the right thing immediately all over the world, things are almost definitely going to get worse for a lot longer than 20 or 30 years. Our climate is going to be deteriorating almost certainly during the whole of this century, possibly a lot longer. We cannot mitigate our way out of this. We cannot prevent a problem that is already here and is bound to get worse. Right? So of course we should do everything we can on the mitigation front, but we also need to, do, to adapt. We need to adapt to the changes that are coming. How are we going to do that? It's going to be incredibly, incredibly hard. What is one thing that is certain is that it's not going to be enough to adapt in the following way, what we call shallow adaptation. It's not going to be enough to try to perpetuate our current way of life in these radically changing circumstances that are going to come. So when people, for, for example, build a, a higher uh, seawall or build uh, new flood protections alongside a, a river in the form of walls, they're basically saying, oh, it's OK. You know, we can cope with more rain. We can cope with higher uh, sea levels. We can carry on just as we are. No, we can't. The sea levels are going to go on rising for a very long time. The floods are going to go on getting worse for a very long time. We have to find ways of adapting that are more fleet of foot than that. We have to find ways of adapting that work with nature rather than against nature. So in terms of flood defenses, for example, we need to be restoring uh, wetlands that uh, absorb uh, water uh, rather than trying to rely, rely on artificial uh, uh, walls to keep us safe. And also, there's another aspect here, which is, of course, the very building of the wall is itself carbon intensive. Right? That's itself making the problem worse. We need to do things that make the problem better, less bad, simultaneously. Yeah? That's what transformative adaptation is. It's saying, let's adapt in ways that are mitigatory at the same time. And that's a win-win. Yeah? Let's work with nature rather than against nature. Let's be trying to transform our societies in the kind of way that we need to transform them anyway, right? while adapting to the changes that are coming, that are definitely coming down the pike at us. So that's just one example of the kind of thing we should do in transformative adaptation. There's a whole, whole set of, set of things that we need to be doing. And there's, there's literature on this, and there's more all the time. Uh, some people call it natural climate solutions. Uh, the UN are talking about it. My think tank Greenhouse are talking about it. Uh, in our book, um, Facing Up to Climate Reality, which I'll remind you about later, which is coming out imminently, uh, we're centering on this point. 
that we need transformative adaptation. If we're going to have any chance at transformation, we need to do this in a massive way. And we need to do this definitely on top of the existing mitigation stuff that's going on. But as I've said, we also need to accept that our effort to transform the society may well fail. Therefore, we need something which goes beyond transformative adaptation. And that's what my friend and colleague, Jim Bendel, has called deep adaptation. So what is deep adaptation? Deep adaptation is adaptation which is premised on the possibility, the probability, some would say the certainty. I disagree with them. I think we can't be certain what the future holds, and there is a chance still of transformation. Some would say the certainty of collapse. Certainly, certainly we need to be working on the basis that collapse is entirely possible and objectively, rationally, many of us would now say probable. So what deep adaptation says is we need to adapt to the likelihood that collapse is going to occur. So what does that mean? Even if we're, we're hoping it's not, it's, we need to have this as the ultimate insurance policy. So what does that mean? Well, for example, it means things like this. This is the uh, seed vault at uh, Svalbard, the world's greatest seed bank. We need to be creating seed banks so that after a collapse-type event, people are in a better position to recreate agriculture and to recreate it in changing climatic conditions uh, um, rather than being just sort of <laughs> thrown into it with nothing. We need to have a lot of seed banks and a lot of biobanks um, around the world. And we need to be trying to protect them against the changing climatic conditions uh, that are coming. So some of you will be aware that tragically this marvelous um, um, seed bank at, uh, at Svalbard, if you don't know about Svalbard, um, it's in the far north, it's up in the ice. Um, some of you will know about it from Philip Pullman's Northern Lights, um, Svalbard, polar bears, etc., living up there. Um, uh, unfortunately, something which is sort of anticipated in the story of uh, Northern Lights and his dark materials uh, is the possible melting of some of that snow and ice, and that's what's happened recently at Svalbard. Because of the terrible changes in the Arctic, a load of the ice there, which they thought was just safely going to encase these seeds for generations, melted. The seed bank got flooded. Uh, it's been, uh, it's been uh, repaired, but that's an example of the kind of problem that we're facing already, just at one degree of global overheat. So deep adaptation means building a bunch of these things and trying to make them safe against future climatic alteration and deterioration. What else does deep adaptation mean? Well, possibly the most important single thing it means is that we've got to make um, nuclear power and nuclear waste safe. People used to think that nuclear power was a potential way in which we could help head off the, uh, the climate uh, catastrophe that we're now brewing. They used to say nuclear power is relatively low emissions compared to uh, fossil fuels. Um, I'm not sure that that's actually true. We could debate that if you want, but it's really a side issue. Um, so we should go nuclear, uh, and that will help us to achieve our climate targets. But once you start to understand that the sea levels are rising and they are going to go on rising for a long time, once you start to understand how objectively probable it is now that society is going to collapse, once you start to understand that we need deep adaptation, then you start to understand that it is completely insane at this moment in history to bet on nuclear power. It's completely unacceptable. Nuclear power produces waste that remains highly toxic for hundreds of years. Nuclear power stations are virtually all located on the coast, the very coast where the sea levels are rising, because of the massive amounts of water that they need. What do they need that water for? And the main things they need that water for is keeping cool spent fuel rods. If you don't keep them cool um, in a very, very short time, uh, they spontaneously ignite. Uh, and if, they are not, uh, if those fires are not put out, they will burn um, um, unchecked vast amounts of toxic waste into the atmosphere for decades or possibly centuries. If you're facing a possible collapse event, even if it's only in part of the world, you need to do everything you possibly can to make sure that all the nuclear power and nuclear waste there is made safe, which is an incredibly tall order. I'm not talking about just you know, made safe against terrorists, although that's a, a worry. I'm talking about made safe against these processes that will occur unless human beings are there in very organized fashions to look after that stuff and make sure that it doesn't ignite, make sure that it doesn't melt down and so on. Nuclear power is an absolute 
recipe for disaster. It's playing Russian roulette at a time of potential collapse and of definite um, sea level rise and uh, increased uh, climatic and weather instability. So one part of the deep adaptation agenda says, we need to be shutting down nuclear power stations now. We need to be, of course, not building new ones. We need to have a massive program of trying to make that way safe against these possibilities or likelihoods. And finally, deep adaptation is arguably a kind of quite significant change in state of mind as, as well and orientation. Like, if we are potentially facing collapse, well, what's most important to me? What do I want to prioritize in the years that may remain to me? What does this mean? What does this mean in terms of feelings of, uh, of grief, of loss, of overwhelm, and so on and so forth? I'll come back to this, but if anyone's um, negatively psychologically affected by what we're talking about in this, uh, in this talk today, then a couple of things. Firstly, um, you're not alone, and in many ways, your response is a healthy one. Right? It should be awesomely horrible and stri strickening us with, with grief and more to contemplate uh, this stuff. And secondly, there is uh, help available. For example, uh, there's an organization called the Climate Psychology Alliance, um, which uh, they have therapists who are specifically working on this and, and so on and so forth. And that's all part of deep adaptation, is adapting ourselves and our, and our, and our psyches to, to this changed world in which we can no, wrong, no longer rely on the perpetuation of anything like what we're used to. Where we were talking about uh, deep adaptation, and we were talking about our, our terrible fears for the future and our, and our grief and so on. And one of the things which I think is really important that we do, that you do, is that you allow yourself to, to feel this stuff. Don't try to suppress it. It is, as I say, it's a healthy response. Right? To, 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 the, the, to the terrible situation that we've got ourselves into, it's a healthy response to be afraid, to be sad, deeply uh, sad, to be furious. And this is an energy which we can then use and work through. The point is not to get stuck in it, but to allow yourself to feel it, just to express it, to share it, and then to use it as an energy to take you to somewhere different. That's what happened at Rebellion Day 2. So there's a, a funeral casket with our future written on the the side of it. And then that's what we do with the energy. Yeah? Rebel. Governments that have put us in this situation are not legitimate. Yeah, how can a government be legitimate, which is on a smooth course towards the path that I described earlier? Right? If we do not radically, radically change course, this civilization, industrial growth society, will collapse. Right? How can governments that are committing us to that destination be legitimate? So the, the laws no longer bind us. Rebel. The time is now for nonviolent action of all sorts, including direct action. We really are in a last chance saloon for any chance at transformation, and we need to be moving ahead fast on transformative and deep adaptation. And very little of that is happening. So we need to step up to the plate now and try to make it happen. We need to do that for all sorts of reasons, which will be obvious to you, but one reason I want to mention in particular is that if we don't do it, I think we're going to regret it. You know, if, if, if it gets to 2025 or 2030 and it's become more and more obvious, and remember the massive time lags, more and more obvious that we are committed to some kind of uh, collapse. And if we didn't really, really try, well, there was still time to stop it. You know, how are we going to face ourselves? How are we going to look ourselves in the, in the, in the eye if we look in the mirror at night? More importantly, how are we going to face our children or our, or our grandchildren? Right. We need to know at least that we did everything that was possible. The odds are absolutely stacked against us, but we've got to try. And everything we succeed in doing will make what's coming less bad. Everything that we succeed in doing will at least give ourselves some kind of softer landing, some kind of greater chance for that second of the three possibilities, for instance, right? Of not completely ruining everything forever, and of at least there being a better chance for those who come after us to build something new out of what we've got. If, for example, we've managed to avoid a kind of toxic time bomb 
of, uh, of nuclear waste all over the planet uh, by the time that um, a collapse uh, occurs. That will, in itself will be an absolutely huge uh, achievement with a, a very long um, time print into the future. So let's talk a little bit about this, option five. This is a very, very important one, not option five, item five. The fifth of the things, not an option, the fifth of the things that we need to be doing uh, um, in the situation that we face. So here we are, Extinction Rebellion, and there's our brilliant hourglass symbol. And I hope my talk is making clear just how the time is trickling through that with the kind of rapidity depicted uh, in uh, The Wizard of Oz. You remember the the Wicked Witch of the, of the West with her hourglass where the sand seems to fall through it faster than, than seems physically possible. Um, it's kind of where we are. And that's uh, Westminster Bridge, which I know some of you in this room were, were on a few months ago. And that's uh, Rebellion Day 2 again, I believe. Um, so... Uh, um, Tiana and Skeena and I were sort of in the middle of the melee there. I'm sure a few others of you in the room were there that, uh, that day. Um, great days and really important, for those of you who haven't been on these kind of mass actions, really important perhaps to mention that I said before, this was a, this was a day of great kind of mourning and sadness. It was also a day of enormous kind of happiness. After, after, we, started, after we left Parliament Square and kind of marched off down Whitehall and went to Buckingham Palace, there was, um, there was a, an atmosphere of, of, of great kind of solidarity and some of the time of great joy and humor. These, these things can be enormously empowering. It's partly because we're there together and we realize that we're not alone anymore in facing this. And that's a point that I'm going to come back to in a moment. It's liberating. It's liberating to do these kinds of things. It's liberating to face these kinds of realities. You know, if you've been stuck in the silo of your house or stuck in the silo of your head, having these kind of worries or having, as I do, for example, sometimes really horrendous dreams about what's likely to be coming down the pike uh, at us. When you actually start to do something about it and when you actually allow yourselves to contemplate the full reality and the full horror of it, it's perhaps counterintuitively somewhat and, and sometimes hugely uh, liberating. Something you've been trying to kind of hold it at arm's length. You've been trying to focus on other things. You've been trying not to think about it too much. You're worried that it's going to sink you into depression or despair. But actually, you can work through those things. And doing something about it is part of the way you work through it. So I'd encourage you, any of you who have been participating in this, to remind yourself of that and to feel it and to communicate it to other people, this sense of liberation. And for those of you who haven't done it yet, to look forward to it. Right, so here are our demands. Those of you who are far away, I'll just uh, run over them for any of you who don't know them. First demand is basically tell the truth, which is what I've been trying to do this afternoon in a pretty uncompromising fashion. Tell the truth about how thing, bad things are. And this applies above all to the government and to the media. But it also applies to each and every one of us. It applies to Extinction Rebellion. It applies to you. It applies to me. That's why I give these talks, because I think that we have to face this uncompromisingly. The second demand is the UK carbon zero by 2025. That is an eye-watering demand. That is far more ambitious than any sort of Green New Deal plans yet developed. That is not a demand that can be achieved by allowing the current system to stagger on forward, even in a radically reformed fashion. If we're going to achieve that kind of aim, we're going to have to do the kind of thing, for example, for starters, that Franklin Roosevelt did in the Second World War. I love this. I love this story. Franklin Roosevelt, his ministers, went to uh, the automobile makers in the United States and said, OK, this is what we want you to do to produce the tanks and planes that we're going to need. And they replied to him, but Mr. President, I don't think you understand. If we do that, we won't be able to produce any cars in the next few years. And Roosevelt said, yep, yeah, that's the point. You've got it. That's the kind of thing we need to do, right? We need to stop producing cars. We need to take a load of the cars that exist off the road. Not just to have electric cars and hybrids and nice things like that. We need to stop producing cars. We need to take a lot of the cars that are off the road. We need not just to have nice renewable energy power stations. We need to shut down a load of the existing power stations, starting, I would argue, the reason I gave a few minutes ago, uh, with the nuclear ones, even before the, uh, the fossil fuel ones, um, although they're also pretty bloody urgent. 
Um, this is going to be, this is what I was saying earlier, right? transformation doesn't mean we get to carry on our existing way of life using green energy and so on, right? and insulating our, our roofs. Yeah, of course we've got to do all that. It means a much bigger change in our way of life. Either we do that, or it gets forced on us, or something much worse gets forced on us. Right? That is the choice that we face now. Right? The choice between complete catastrophe and the first of my three options, and the third option, transformation, is the choice about whether you're going to do it voluntarily, or whether you're going to let nature, an enraged nature, and tor tormented, tortured nature, uh, force it uh, uh, upon us. And the third demand, very, very interesting one, uh, we need a real uh, democracy. Um, the governments which uh, have been uh, ruling us, which have failed uh, so atrociously, are no longer legitimate. So they need supplementing or, or replacing by some more successful form of democracy, which recognizes the scale of the emergency that we face. And the way that we in Extinction Rebellion propose to do that is by means of citizens' assemblies. Very exciting, radical demand. Citizens' assemblies would be democratic because they run essentially on the, on the same principle that the jury system, which is an absolutely essential part of our democracy, going back to Magna Carta and so forth, runs on. Random selection from the population. You think of these citizens' assemblies as like super juries, which are going to help us to find the path to this radically mitigated and radically adapted future and radically transform. Something else I want to mention. Many of you probably are aware of this amazing young person Greta Thunberg, who I had the privilege of eulogizing at Rebellion Day 2 a few months ago. Uh, she started as a lone individual, just goes to show you what one person can do and get started. She started the climate school strikes, which are now sweeping the world. So uh, the caption here reads, for a fourth week, tens of thousands of children have skipped school in Belgium to join protests demanding tougher action against climate change. So Greta Thunberg, one person, has now launched a worldwide movement, tens of thousands in Belgium alone. It's happened recently in, in, uh, in this country. The next uh, climate school strike day in this country is uh, the 15th of uh, March, coming up quite soon now. I do hope everyone in the room will be super supportive of that. As I see it, this is a, a huge, new, exciting development to complement what Extinction Rebellion are, do, are doing. It's, it's terrible that it's come to this. Right? It's terrible that, that we have to confront children and they're confronting themselves with this reality. It's terrible that children of seven, eight, ten years old and so on are realizing, uh, why should I go to school if, if I'm unlikely to have a future under this system? Well, these schools are going to be irrelevant if I just need to learn things like growing food and so on. Yeah? It's absolutely terrible that it's come to that. It's also unbelievably inspiring that they're taking up the the baton, that they're taking up the, the opportunity, that they're rising to the challenge, that they're rising up. They are the ones who are inspiring us now. It's awesomely inspiring. And it makes something new possible because it is something quite new in the history of, of the world, certainly in the history of modern protest. Item six, we need to talk. What do I mean by this? So a couple of things. Firstly, I mean that in a few minutes I'm going to stop this talk and we're going to have a Q&A and a discussion because it is absolutely vital after a talk like this that we have a serious opportunity to exchange and go into some of this and people have an opportunity to voice what they're feeling as well as what they're thinking. It would be utterly inappropriate for me to give a talk like this sort of as a lecture and then just kind of leave and sort of leave you all uh, with it. So we've got to see how this is landing and reflect on it together. But I also mean the point more generally that as I already implied earlier, I believe, and my experience so far has very much been, that when you look at this in the right way, and when you look at it open-heartedly, and when you look at it with full honesty, it can actually be hugely liberating and empowering to do so. And that requires us to look at it together, and it requires us to dialogue and exchange for people to voice and express what they are feeling and what they are thinking uh, about this. For far too long, far too many of us have tried to remain quiet about this stuff. And what's happening now with the Extinction Rebellion, with the climate school strikes, it's awfully late. We're awfully, awfully late compared to where we ought to be, given the time lags, etc., etc. Very much better late than never. But it's awfully late. If only we had started this kind of conversation earlier. Why didn't we? I think the main reason we didn't is too many of us were hoodwinked by this mainstream thought that you've got to remain optimistic. 
You've got to tell people a positive story. You mustn't make people depressed. Scaring people never does any good. This is all just shit. None of it's true. Right? Extinction Rebellion is proving that it's not true. Extinction Rebellion is proving that you can hugely motivate people by saying, be scared, be terrified, be angry, be grief-stricken. Right? The situation is appalling. We've got to face it honestly. We need to cry out with our pain and rage about what's happening. And then we might actually start to do something decent about it. And it's the same thing that Greta is saying. She's saying to the politicians, I want you to be terrified. I want you to act like our house is on fire, like our world is on fire. Because it is. Yeah. Because it is. And one of the consequences of the kind of heating we're almost certainly going to see this century is going to be wildfires out of control everywhere in the world in the summer period. That's another reason why agriculture, as we know it, is almost certainly going down. Right? Our world is on fire. We ought to be scared. We ought to be furious. And we need to talk about that. And for far too long, we didn't because we were afraid of people attacking us or we were afraid that we would demoralize people, or we were afraid that we were out of step with everybody else, or we were afraid that we were just fantasizing it all. No, none of those things are true. Right? What's true is that this is real. This is coming down the pike. We are, if you will, the vanguard of understanding this. There is a terrible mental health crisis gripping our society. But believe you me, you ain't seen nothing yet. It's going to be far, far worse as a lot of people including, tragically, a lot of young people wake up to this over the coming 5, 10, 15 years and realize, oh, Christ, what is my life going to be like? What can I actually uh, look forward to? What do I have to rationally fear and so on and so forth? There is going to be a, a much bigger mental health crisis. And a lot of us in the room have been sort of at the leading edge of experiencing uh, that. We need to talk to find ways through that. And we need to know how to help other people as they come on board, if you will, in larger and larger numbers of feeling this stuff and of being willing to act on it too. And this is why, because, as Paul Kingsnorth of the Dark Mountain puts it, there is an abyss opening up before us. It challenges everything we thought we knew about our culture and nature. We need to look into it and concentrate on what we can see. We need to look into it, we need to concentrate, we need to meditate, we need to pause, we need to talk. And that's my final point. Stop, pause, the seventh of my items of what is to be done. Because it's very tempting, perhaps, if you hear this kind of talk, to think, well, the best thing to do is for me to rush off and do something about it. And of course, there's lots of urgent stuff that we need to do. We can't, we can't hang around. We're way, way behind the clock. We need to get on with it really, really quickly in terms of transforming, in terms of adapting, in terms of radical activism, and much, much more. But if we simply rush headlong into stuff without giving ourselves a chance to fully feel it, without giving ourselves a chance to talk about it, without getting a, give it, giving, giving it a real chance to land, then we'll be still sort of running while trying to, trying to fire fight with half of our minds or with our own egos. We won't be using our energy in a maximally effective way. We won't be, for example, clear in how to make the choices about what we want to do or ought to be doing, how we want to prioritize, because there are seven things I've offered you here, and I think most of us should do some of most of them, but there'll be some of you that want to focus more on some of them rather than rather than others. You know, some might focus more on policy work, others might focus more on nonviolent direct action, and so on. You're not going to be able to prioritize, you're not going to be able to choose, you're, you're going to be too much of a headless chicken if you don't do a bit of this. So please, right now and later on, and any time when you feel the sense of urgency kind of overwhelming you, give yourself a chance to stop, which is a little moment for us to stop. I'm drawing to, I really am drawing towards a close. This is what I see as the kind of spiritual dimension of the crisis that we're facing and where we are with it, where we need to be with it. This is what I think happens. That when we do what I'm trying to talk about here this afternoon, when we face reality, 
when we have the courage to see what is and to see what is coming, well, then we rise up to meet it. When we have the courage to look climate reality and extinction reality, biodiversity loss and so on in the face, when we really perceive adequately ecologically and politically, then we rise up to meet it. And our rising up is what is now desperately needed. So I would say our ecological perception, our psycho-spiritual awakening, and our socio-political uprising are all aspects of the same whole, the same process. They're all basically the same thing when you see this thing right. Seeing it, feeling it, waking up, rising up. It's all the same thing. The arising consciousness rises to meet what it faces that's wrong. And when it does that, when we do that, well, then they will hear our lion's roar. <laughs> they will. And in the darkness of this time, I think the beauty of what is in nature and the beauty of what is and what can be in us shines out all the more against the awful background of that darkness. And I think that however bad it gets, however bad it gets, there's a certain sense in which it's okay. Because however bad it gets, if you are willing to look it in the face, and if you're willing to feel what, you're, what you feel, and if you're willing to rise up in spirit and in body to act on that, well, then it can be okay again. And that is the wonderful thing about being beings that are conscious, that however bad things get, if we're able to be our truest selves, we can face that, and then we can rise up, and then we can overcome it. OK, to begin at the end, or to end at the beginning. Your money or your life. I want to come back to this slogan, and this time it's me saying it to you, not a highwayman. All right? If you believe the things I've been saying this afternoon, then you need to act on them. And among the things that that means is you need to decide how you are going to rise up fully adequately in this way to this challenge. So I want to suggest to you that for some of you in this room, the best way to do that might be to use your money. Because there will be people in this room who have 30, 50, 80,000 pounds lying around in some bank account. That is not going to be any use to you or to your children if society collapses. If you use it now, that could be very significant. There will be people in this room whose houses are worth hundreds, hundreds of thousands of pounds, maybe a million pounds. Wow. Think what that could do. The total budget so far of Extinction Rebellion has been about 200,000 pounds. There are literally people in this room who could double that right now, individuals or a few of you together. If you're one of those people, and you believe what I've been saying, then I really want to invite you to draw the requisite conclusion. You cannot buy a safe future for yourself or for your children individually. You might just be able to contribute towards something amazing happening if you put that money into a, a channel where it can really, really do something and liberate something. And remember that in this country, we are at the forefront of this. Extinction Rebellion is starting here. I mean, it's, it's about time. You know, we started the bloody Industrial Revolution. We should take a leader, serious leadership on this. And we are. And then there'll be a lot of other people in this room who don't have any significant amount of income or wealth. But everybody has their time. Right? Everybody has their life. And there are people in this room who have given up their jobs already to devote themselves to this cause. There's a, there's a couple there. And there are other people in this room who are pouring themselves into jobs that are directly relevant to this. Think about what your job is at this moment in history. Could you change it? Could you use the job you've got to really do something good? Could you give it up? Could you go part time? And then there'll be other people for whom that's not, none of those things are really a possibility. But everybody has their bodies, right? 
Everybody has a body that they can put on the line. The Extinction Day, International Day of Rebellion is coming up on April the 15th. We need tens of thousands of people in London willing to put their bodies on the line for that. The world is going to be watching. Something incredible could happen and start on that date and on the days that follow. So I want to say to you, your money or your life, you cannot buy a safe future for yourself. You cannot buy it for your children. Not even the rich can do that. Some rich people are trying to produce them for themselves, hideaways where they can survive uh, a collapse event. Um, they're worried about how they can do it successfully. Most of them don't think they figured out a way they can do it. They're right. Even if they could prolong things for 10 or 15 years, what good does that really do? If they really care about their children, isn't that what we care about more than anything else as human beings? We are mammals, we are primates. We love our children above all others. If you really love your children, you've got to love their children as well. And so it goes on, this chain of love pointing out into the future indefinitely. If you say to your children, look, I really love you, so I'm going to give you a really good life, and I'm really sorry your children are going to have an absolutely shit life, then the answer your child will give you is, you don't actually really love me. And that's a situation that everybody in the world is in, including even the super rich, who are trying to protect themselves and their children, but are actually committing the world to a terrible future. The only way we can save ourselves here, if we are going to save ourselves, if we are going to transform, or at least to give ourselves a decent chance of adapting, to the terrible things coming down the pike uh, at us and giving future generations a chance of building something better than we have is if we do it together and if we do it now or bloody soon. So I want to say to you, your money or your life, and I want you to take that message away from this talk with you, and I want you to look at yourselves in the mirror this evening. I want you to ask yourselves the same question. Which is it going to be? What form is this going to take uh, for me? And there's one more way in which you could ask that question as well, which is that you could imagine your child asking it to you. Yeah? Remember what I said before about you, what you don't want to do is get to 2030, and the banks are collapsing and whatever, and your money is useless. Um, and uh, you say to you, you, your child, well, I sort of tried. I, I did something. You know, I gave a, a 10 pound a, a month standing order. No, that doesn't cut it at this point. A 10 pound a month standing order or a jumble sale, you know, once every three months or something that I organize. That is not it. It's your money or your life. Or if you've got both, then both. Thank you.